so I'm Rachel. I didn't want to say very much in the introduction because I think it has more power coming as part of the introduction to this speech. Uh, I got involved in Extinction Rebellion uh, when the Gail Bradbrook uh, video was first shown in the Quaker Meeting House. I, as I said, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm a primary teacher in Chichester. I used to be a chartered accountant as well, so I'm not exactly a rebellious type. I got interested in climate change in the 1980s, sorry, the 1990s, uh, when I, I thought that, you know, the, there, there was an awful lot happening and nobody seemed to be noticing. And was it actually true? So uh, I did an open university degree in environmental science, uh, discovered it was, and then waited really for something to happen as a result of it. And uh, nothing did. And I carried on seeing the signs. You could see glacial retreat, you could see signs of extreme weather, but nothing really seemed to be being done about it. It was just sort of the old sensationalist apparently article in a newspaper so i was really really relieved when i came along to the Gail bradbrook talk and realized that there were other people who were also spotting the signs and wanted to do something about it and, and that's how i became involved really um i was a member of the outreach and training group i have quite significant family responsibilities so i haven't been able to do as much as uh, i would like but uh, one thing i can do is these talks and i'm very happy to carry on doing them this is my first Zoom, so fingers crossed it all works. Now, this talk is a standard talk. It's not me putting the slides together. This is something that is done by Extinction Rebellion centrally, and we are, obviously we put our own slant on it, but this is uh, given around all around the country to encourage people to join the movement. Uh, judging by your own introductions, for many of you, this is really an update or a refresher of stuff you already know. Um, and I hope you find it interesting because I think things have changed. If you're new to it, it is incredibly shocking. But um, I'd like to say up front, you know, it's important to remember that you're not alone. It's not just 14 of us, there's a lot more than that. So we're going to talk a bit more about Extinction Rebellion a little bit later on. But for now, just one slide of introduction. So we're a non-violent direct action civil protest movement. We're everyday citizens looking for a solution to the environment, sorry, to the climate ecological crisis. Uh, I think a key point is that we've recognised that individual action is not going to be sufficient to tackle these crises and we'll talk about that a bit later on. But if it's not about individual action we must get our governments here and at home and internationally to take decisive action on our behalf. It's their job to support and protect us, that's what they pledged to do when they took office. Now the world's most pressing problems are very closely linked and at the heart of it all is power. So financial and governmental power is concentrated in the hands of a very small minority of humanity, global leaders, global corporate corporations, financial institutions, mega rich. And this concentration of power doesn't care about the damage it does to the earth and it perpetuates great inequalities among humanity. Now, obviously, you can't do justice, as it were, to global justice with just one slide or even in the 30 minutes. But, you know, some examples, people of colour are disproportionately affected by the adverse effects of climate change in the global south. And even in industrial nations such as ours, people of colour are dying of COVID at twice the rate of white people. They're also disproportionately affected by air pollution. They have lower life expectancy, less access to education and suffer more pre police brutality. So many movements are advocating for a better distribution of justice, if you like, true justice, a more equal distribution of power and resources. So XR stands with Black Lives Matter. We also advocate for equal rights for everyone, including LB, LGBTQ, sorry, I can never say those five things in the right order, refugee rights, and an end to famine, water stress, and air pollution. So, you know, aiming low. Now our core really is looking at this. Our civilization is much more fragile than we like to think and I think Covid has shown us a, a little bit of a hint of that. Um, just in case, I hope you can see the slides, I know that it, it's not great resolution on some, so Covid-19 is a small wave, the recession is the next wave up and climate change is the enormous wave that overpowers both. So the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how, val how vulnerable our big, strong technological society really is and it gives us a clue what the much bigger and nastier monster of climate crisis is going to be like. 
just to show really that going back to naught to business as usual is not an option. Now our planet is so important. Everything we need for survival is here on the surface, in the air and in the biosphere. But we're causing climate destruction and ecological destruction on a massive scale. We're threatening the survival of living creatures and of plants as well as ourselves. So I'm going to start by talking about the climate crisis. If you've heard this talk before, if you follow environmental issues in the news, you're probably quite familiar with it all. But for me, uh, it, it's amazing that the evidence just keeps on getting clearer. It keeps on getting stronger. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide pretty much stayed somewhere between 280 parts per million. That's that red line on the graph in front of you. After the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide emissions and therefore concentrations in the atmosphere uh, began to skyrocket. And you can see that towards the right hand side of the graph. So this rise in atmospheric concentration is mainly due to burning of fossil fuels such as coal and oil and gas. And I should say, in fact, I should have said it at the beginning, um, that I've got references for absolutely everything here. If there's something that you're thinking, oh, that sounds a bit unlikely, uh, can I find out where you got that from? Please just make a note of it, email me later, and I will email you back the reference because I wouldn't want you to be making any of this up, or indeed the texts are making any of this up. So we've got a situation where the scientific consensus is overwhelming. There's no doubt left that humans are causing global heating. And this consensus is shared by over 99% of climate scientists. Scientists from all over the world also agree that all the warming since 1950 is due to humans and nearly all the warming since 1850 is due to greenhouse gas emissions and other human activities. And this chart shows really how global average temperatures have been rising in, in tandem with atmospheric carbon dioxide. It shows atmospheric of carbon dioxide over the last past 2000 years, that's the red line I was talking about, and then the average annual temperature from 1880 to 2019, and that's the blue squiggly, squiggly line. Now, you may have heard of the hockey stick graph. This is it for obvious reasons, more of an American hockey stick than an English one, I think. And although there is some variation from year to year, you can see that the CO2 trend is upwards and it's closely followed by the temperature. Our global average annual carbon dioxide concentration in 2019 was 411 parts per million. Now, around the time that I was starting my science degree, my environmental studies degree in 1995, it was at about 350 parts per million. And the thought of it getting to 410 parts was sort of uh, beyond the pale. Well, we're beyond that now. Each year brings new record levels and the rate of increase is increasing as well. It's not just going up, but it's going up faster. And the, that increased CO2 causes an increased temperature rise. Now, this isn't really a surprise because about 200 years ago, when we really first began to, to burn fossil fuels, the scientists of that day started to correlate well, actually, if we're increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we're going to be increasing the temperature as well. So you know, we shouldn't really be too surprised about this. Now, we've exploited all these fossil fuels, all this gas and coal, to build our industrial civilization and to live our very comfortable Western lifestyle. So it's all on us, really. Now, sometimes when you talk about global heating, you might hear, well, that's had several warm periods in the past, so what's the big deal? And it's true that there have been warm periods in the past, but those periods have not happened during our current human civilization. This is my least favorite XR graph, because I think it's just got so much on it that really requires explaining. The green line along the middle is the present day temperature, and then you've got plus two degrees and plus four degrees going up on the red dots. And this is where I would be looking around the room, hoping to see you nodding that you understood this. Um, the squiggly line is the temperature, average temperatures across that period. Now along the bottom, which is a bit tricky because certainly it's covered with something on mine, it's thousands of years before the present. So the present day is right across on the right hand side and then we go 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago and so on. 
until you get to the single digit numbers on the left hand side, by which time you're looking at millions of years. So two millions, three millions, four millions, five millions. And you can see that at that five million point, we were up at four degrees centigrade on this planet. So what you can see is that for the last 10,000 years, so really during the time of the current human civilization, we've had a really stable climate and that's called the Holocene period. We've developed agriculture and cities, we've spread out and we've covered the surface of the earth, very much our Goldilocks period. Now, as you can see from this graph, during that time, we've been at the current temperature. If you look at that two degrees higher temperature line, that hasn't been around at the same time as humans. So human civilization has not existed on an earth that was two degrees hotter than it is at present. And we don't know if it can. So very much in uncharted territory here. And as you'll see later on, we are rather horribly close to all that. Now, the climate crisis is not something bad that might happen in the future. It's no longer something as it was in 1995 when we were thinking, this is real, this is going to happen. It's something bad that's happening right now. And there's already four big effects of just 1.1 degree of heating above pre-industrial levels. Top left, I think we could all guess that one, drought. Global warming has contributed to droughts and since at least 1900, and that influence is getting stronger. But at the same time as that, we've got too much water in all the wrong places, and we are getting much more intense storms. So when we introduce more heat into a system, heat's a form of energy, it becomes more energetic. So it's true about wildfires and it's true about storms too. So we get bigger and more devastating hurricanes that are already linked to climate change. Uh, unprecedented fires. Now I've been talking about these at these talks for some time now and every year there are new examples. These are increasing around the world in number, duration and size. And recently we've had Siberia and the Amazon, Australia, in the first talk I ever gave, it was about uh, California. The Australian fires in November 2019 destroyed around 17 million hectares, an area about the size of France, and around a billion animals, birds and reptiles burned to death. Final slide, sea level rise, which is always a good headliner really. Melting glaciers and ice sheets are causing sea level rise, and coastal extreme events are becoming more severe. Now the rate of sea level rise is accelerating and has, is unprecedented over the last century. Um, worst case scenarios of a two metre rise by the end of this century can't be ruled out. And in the longer version of this uh, slideshow, you can see uh, what two metres would do around here. I'd like you to remember that between 20 and 40% of the global human population live in areas that have already experienced warming of more than one and a half degrees C. It's not evenly distributed around the earth. So why don't we do something about this? Um, I know someone had mentioned a, a, a sort of discussion of this earlier. Well, one of the reasons is that we're kind of hardwired to deal with predators, nasty things that sneak up on us and threaten us immediately. These slow but lethal events are not ones that we jump around and try and solve so much. But this is all happening at 1.1 degrees C. But what about the future? So we're already at the 1.1 degree C above pre-industrial levels is how we're measuring it. And we're heading to three degrees C with current policies. Now, given our historic failure to curb emissions, we could be heading to even more by the end of this century, and that would be disastrous for much of the world's population. So what happens as the heating continues? Well, our options are now limited, really. Between, we've got a choice between an unmitigated disaster, in the very literal form of the words, and a slightly less bad disaster. What about the future? Rather alarming slide. World hunger is rising after being in decline for many years. More than 820 million people don't have enough to eat. Many global heating driven extreme weather events like heat waves, heavy rainfall, coastal flooding are likely to get more extreme both in frequency and intensity. 
more areas will, dis will experience water shortages, severe water shortages due to droughts and the melting of the glaciers so that their water source has gone. By 2025, five years time, four billion people are projected to be living in water stressed areas. So climate chaos is on track to produce mass displacement of somewhere between 200 million and a billion people by 2050. If global temperatures reach three degrees, as forecast by the end of the century, about a third of the world's population will be living in extreme heat. Now, this warming is quite serious enough, but there's a risk that it will be even worse as a result of feedback loops and tipping points. This is where it'd be really handy to be able to point at a screen. So we've got heating, so the world is getting hotter, but that has feedback loops. It just doesn't get hotter in a linear sort of way. And those feedback loops increase the amount of heat until you get to a tipping point at which reversing that heat gain isn't possible. And we move on very much to hot house earth. So we're talking about really amplifiers of climate change. And one of the feedback loops, which is perhaps quite straightforward to understand, is um, ice, ice at the poles. Ice at the poles is very reflective. It has what's called an albedo effect, which means it the, the sun's energy reaches it and it bounces it off back, you know, away from us, out of out of the way. So, with the loss of ocean ice, the ocean, in contrast, absorbs that heat from the sun. So the poles start warming faster. More ice melts. There's your feedback loop. So you've got a continuous heating loop. Because the poles are warming faster and this ice is melting, the ice is fresh water, not salt water. So as it goes into the ocean, it can change the salinity of various areas of the ocean, change the balance between fresh water and salt water, and that can have an effect on ocean currents. So I hope that explains some of the, uh, the words you hear about feedback loops and tipping points. In summary, really, the longer we leave it, the harder it gets. So we need to take drastic action to reduce emissions now to avoid having to take even more drastic measures later. And to be honest, this looks like we're already going to have to take pretty drastic measures, doesn't it? Covid has shown us what drastic measures can look like. Um, we don't really want to have to turn off the economy so suddenly just to survive. The sooner we take action, the easier and the less painful it will be. So to have a good chance of staying below one and a half degrees centigrade warming, global CO2 emissions need to reach zero by about 2025, five years time. If we'd begun reducing emissions from the year 2000, so 10 years after the world knew for sure that we had to cut emissions to avoid a dangerous climate change, we'd have had a reasonable chance to limit global heating to one and a half degrees centigrade at about 4% per annum reductions. And that could have been fairly easily achieved. But we're starting where we are. We need much steeper reductions year on year. And if we leave it later, we will need even more steep uh, reductions. So that was climate. But climate is only part of the problem. In addition to the climate crisis, there's also a crisis in the biosphere. So the ecology of the world, the web of living beings that sustains us, humans depend on a healthy natural environment for our well-being and survival. So we're destroying the land and the ocean ecosystems that we depend on to live it has been called cutting off the branch on which we're standing. In 2019, an international report backed by the United Nations had these things to say about the impact of humans on the planet. So nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history and the rate of species extinction is accelerating. Around a quarter of species are already threatened with extinction. Species are being destroyed at rates at least 10 to 100 times higher than the average extinction rate over the last 10 million years. So boy oh boy have we accelerated that. Humans affect three quarters of land, two thirds of the ocean, three quarters of fresh water, leaving little room for anything else. 85% of wetlands have been destroyed. And the chair of the organisation that produced the report 
said, we are eroding the very foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health and quality of life worldwide. So a mass extinction of species is underway. There have been five of these in the Earth's history and the last one, the famous one, was 60 odd million years ago. Now the current one, very different because it's not caused by natural events, meteors, volcanoes, whatever. It's called by exploding human consumption. And what's more, we know that it's happening and we know why it's happening and perhaps we would be better off calling it an extermination. 10,000 years ago, so that's at the beginning of that Holocene period, our Goldilocks period when we started expanding, um, looking at the biomass living on Earth, the mammals of the world took 99% of them were wild and 1% of them was us, humans. Nowadays, 60% is our livestock, 36% is humans, and only 4% is that wild biomass. And well, how have we been doing this? Um, high intensity industrialized agriculture is one thing. There's an IPCC report from 2019 looking at climate change and land, talking about seven, the fact that we use 70% of the global ice free surface. Agriculture uses around 70% of the fresh water on the planet. Soil erosion is between 10 and 100 times faster than soil formation. We are deforesting the planet as well. That helps desertification, really hard to reverse once you've got rid of moisture in the atmosphere. In the oceans, we're heating oceans. They lose their ability to hold oxygen. So certain species find it hard to live where they've always lived. They either have to move or die. We also have acidification. And, uh, and then we come on to the bit that always makes me cry, frankly. So if I have to cause, you'll have to excuse me. Now I'm 56 and most of the collapse of the ecosystems has taken place in the last 50 years, so since I was a child. My generation grew up knowing a full natural landscape and we might not have seen an elephant, but we knew they were there somewhere. And it really enriched our lives, the fact that there were all these other creatures in the world. I remember learning about extinct animals as a child and thinking the dodo, okay, that went extinct in 1662, a long time ago. Well, people didn't know better then, did they? And even as a child, I thought it was pretty horrific that the passenger pigeon had become extinct in 1914, because surely, I thought, in the 1960s, we knew better by then. Well, we're really, really not doing very well on that point, are we? The amount of extinctions we are generating so the new generation will inherit a reduced world separated from nature not only will they not know those exotic animals the, the elephants and tigers that you see on the news but perhaps more shockingly it's about and this is where i get choking <laughs> the bees and the butterflies lizards frogs they're going to be extinct and our children and our grandchildren won't know them so we are burning the library of life We've taken this rich world, we've stripped it, and we've turned it into an impoverished and infertile planet. And every time I think about that, that uh, catches my throat. So, oh. what must change? Well, if we do nothing else, we need to stop CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning. Everything else is secondary because if we don't do that, then we fail anyway. It's that straightforward. And to have any chance of keeping below two degrees, we need to stop emitting CO2 rapidly, entirely, and forever. Personal action on its own, although very attractive and very worth doing, it will fail as a sole method of approaching this. It's critical that our new approach encourages governments, international organizations, and corporations to change. And that is exactly what XR is here to do. All this information is very shocking, but I think two, two points at this point are worth making. One is you are not alone. It's not just one, just you thinking, what can I do about this? There are plenty of others and there is hope. Now, why do we need to be more aggressive? Well, let's have a look at what we've tried so far. Back in 1988, 
the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, the IPCC. Started having meetings, as you can see, from 1990. We've had global agreements since then, country level legislation, legal challenges. We've done traditional campaigning. We've made personal commitments to reduce emissions, but none of these things have worked. Looking up, we can see uh, in 19, 1992, the Rio Treaty. So that was where the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change began and the Conference of Parties, all these COPs, began 106, 196 countries that year and the EU decided they ought to be doing something about it. So obviously we've, uh, we've had a lot of agreements and attempts since then, but since the formation of the IPCC in 1988, we have emitted more CO2 knowingly than all the emissions that we produced before that. So when people think they're making progress, that we're making progress, we're getting somewhere, just look at that graph. There's no sign that the tendency is changing, even when you include the effect of COVID-19. Now, if this graph keeps on going up like it's currently doing, we are failing. The curve might flatten or reduce because of COVID-19 this year, but to avoid failure, any flattening must be followed by really fast, really deep cuts. And we need to see that curve flattening now and falling to zero and staying at zero. And until we do, it's not working. So all that stuff has not worked. So when the rules don't work for us, we have to break those rules. We wouldn't be the first ones to do so. In fact, breaking the rules in the name of a good cause has a very long, noble tradition. It's been used successfully many times in the past, notably by Gandhi, who organised Indian rebellion against British rule, Rosa Parks, who famously refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white person and triggered the American civil rights movement, and Martin Luther King, who organised that movement and mobilised huge numbers of Americans to force changes to racially discriminatory laws. So these people and the millions who surrounded them are regarded as heroes now, but at the time they were vilified as criminals who were breaking the law. Throughout history, elites with power and money don't give away rights without being pressured to do so. Think of the universal vote, women's suffrage, gay marriage rights, racial discrimination, desegregation, limit, liberty from colonial rule, equality under the law. Think of apartheid, the Velvet Revolution in Eastern Europe in 18, 1989. So civil resistance, also called disobedience or non-violent direct action, NBDA, Extinction Rebellion's preferred term, means that normally law-abiding citizens are breaking rules and laws as a way to force change in a system that is refusing to change. And this is why actions are Exile's main tactic. Now, in order to be able to carry out disruptive actions and create dilemmas for authorities, we need people who are willing to do things that risk arrest. Arrest itself is a form of disruption because it uses police resources and court time. But we've also found that our court cases have created thousands of opportunities to present the issues to the judiciary and reach a part of the establishment. But for every person who's what we would call an arrestable, someone who's willing to be arrested to make this point, there are more than 20 other people, part of the movement, who support them or help the movement in other ways. And there's a big list of such people. Artists, legal observers, trainers, cooks, singers, samba bands, organisers, climbers, the list goes on. Joining XR doesn't mean you have to get arrested. You don't. I can't, because if I'm arrested, it shows on my DBS certificate as a teacher, my head teacher, well at the moment, not particularly sympathetic to that, I might very well lose my job. But there are many other ways you can help and we need you, whether you have an hour a week or you're able to give up a lot more time and volunteer full time. And I particularly want to draw your attention to our top needed tasks at the moment, part of our mass mobilisation strategy. We need people to do leafleting and stalls. We need people to organise phone banking, door knocking, giving this talk and house meetings. And if you can do any of those things, you can help the movement grow as fast as possible. Civil disobedience works when it's a mass movement which is broad and diverse and we want to have as many people as possible actively involved. We have three big clear demands. 
Now, the first one is for the government and media to tell the full truth about the situation we're in. That means the sort of information we've been covering in the first half of this talk, the science side. Everyone should know about this in the same way that people were told about the threat from Nazi Germany, not like the confusion and uncertainty and obfuscation we've seen from governments over the coronavirus pandemic. Our second demand is for the government to set a legally binding target for greenhouse gas emissions to reach net zero by 2025. So act as though the truth is real. Acknowledge that what I've said in the first part of this talk is, is the truth and acknowledge what has to be done to help. The third demand is for a citizens assembly to decide how to address the issues. And their recommendation shouldn't just be advisory, they must be legally binding. They'll be commissioned and funded by the government, but independently organised and run. Now, XR are not saying that they want to be involved in setup, that we know, want to be involved in the setup or running of the assembly, but the aim is to strengthen our democracy. Now, I may be speaking to the converted here. You don't need permission to get involved with XR. You can look at the website, you can get all sorts of information that you might want there on our demands, our values, events, groups, and you can sign up for the UK newsletter. Um, I think that's probably the end of this particular Zoom talk because I think we need to talk about how to do things a little bit more. But I want to leave you with two key points to take away. Don't believe for a second that if you've made your personal commitments, then you've done your bit because forcing government action is necessary. Personal commitments are just not enough. And don't believe for a second, XR's got your back. You can sit back and relax because they're acting on your behalf. We need people, lots more people. We need you and your planet needs you. Life itself needs you. Thank you for listening.